morning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to in power resurrected as we will be when he comes well good morning grace church it's good to be here with you this morning as we gather to worship together and I uh, just wanted to start with a scripture passage. It's a short one, but it is a great reminder for us all. And it comes out of Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What a, what a great reminder for us as we begin our service and uh, just something to, to meditate upon as we sing up here together, the faithfulness of the Lord and, and just the fact that as we gather here in the morning, uh, we're reminded that His mercies are new every day and that is His gift to us, most of all in His Son Jesus Christ who came down to us and gave up His very life for us. And so we celebrate that together. So just as we sing up here, I invite you to meditate upon that, pray, close your eyes, whatever you'd want to do, and, uh, and, and just have freedom to be able to worship.
us Deuteronomy 7 9 know therefore that the Lord your God is God the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations so our God is faithful and we're reminded in that verse also that 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 faithfulness that steadfast love is with those who keep his commandments and we none of us obey them perfectly but just an opportunity as we sing this next song to reflect on that and uh, if there's if there's things in our life even this morning or from this week that we need to repent over this is a great opportunity for that we know that our God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness he just is waiting for us to ask and to give that up to him
Lord God, that is our prayer this morning, that you would be our vision, Lord, that you would be the ruler in our hearts and our lives, Lord, of this church, that we would submit to you and that we would trust that you have and will continue to meet every need of ours. Lord, I just pray that you would be our ultimate treasure, that we would lay aside all other treasures, Lord, that we would lay aside distractions and that we would or just be able to enter into a sweet time of worship this morning and to see you and acknowledge you and to praise and glorify you for who you are. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, yeah, Linnea wants to greet you. Yeah. So I figured there might be some people uh, watching online that haven't gotten the chance, so I figured we would bring up Linnea and just introduce her to everybody in the church. But hi, my name is Austin. I'm the lead pastor here at Grace, and we're really glad that you're here with us. Uh, if you're new or recently new, we're especially glad that you've chosen to join us uh, for worship. You might want to look in our website. If you get out your smart device, you go to gracewalworth.org or just Google search it. From there, you'll be able to find uh, outlines for today's sermon, discussion and reflection questions. We actually have a slide as well that you might be able to throw up too um, so that people can see that. And so you can get the sermon notes and reflection and discussion questions. Uh, also, you can connect with us through the website as well. Uh, under there, there's a section for connection cards and prayer requests. We want to be praying for you. We don't hand out connection cards right now, and, but you can actually check that out online. Um, so if you're new, that's a way for you to get information from us and share information with us. It's also a way for you to share prayer requests, either for the elders and pastor staff or for the whole church, and those will go out as an email um, for prayer needs. I do want to mention the blessing box in the back. We're not passing around the plate for offering, uh, but as you come in or as you leave, you can give your tithes and offerings. You can also do this online using our, our website. Um, and I do also want to mention again what I mentioned last week about the gospel project material. Uh, we are not starting our children's ministry right now, but family discipleship is a key and important foundational vision for us as a church. And we believe that discipleship starts in the home. Uh, that is really where disciples are made uh, for the family of God. So we want to support you in your disciple making. And, and we're doing that by moving and using the gospel project material. And so what we would ask for you to do if you have young kids, uh, download the Lifeway app and purchase, uh, it's like three bucks to purchase uh, the unit that we're in. And this way you can use this at home. I use it with my kids when we eat breakfast. We watch the Bible stories uh, from the Gospel Project material on Lifeway. So please join us in, in, in ministering to your kids and doing family discipleship at, at home. And Rich Austin's going to come up uh, for a moment and tell us about a meeting that we have coming up as a church community. Uh, things have gotten a little bit maybe behind with, uh, with not meeting as a congregation, but we have quite a few things to do as a family. So, Rich, why don't you tell us a little bit more about that? Thank you, Pastor. I'll make this very brief, folks. Um, most of you know that we operate on uh, a budget and a constitution that we've used for years and years. Uh, because of the COVID, we've gotten off track, as the pastor said, and we're several months behind. Uh, we, we need to get back on track, and one of the ways we're wanting to do that is to get the nomination committee moving forward to nominate the people that will serve in the various leadership capacities of our church. Formally, according to the bylaws, we must give two weeks' notice. So today is, I think, the 12th, and so therefore the 26th will be our next a meeting. It'll be a short meeting. We'll have the nominees uh, available for you on a ballot, and then you can elect uh, those people to serve on the nomination committee. These aren't actually the candidates for the positions, just the committee. And if you want to start uh, pre-interviewing them, uh, the first one is Ben Adams, then Michaela Sass, uh, Ann McCombs, and my wife Linda. They're the ones you'll be voting on in two weeks. While we have your attention, we may also review the budget, as the budget uh, takes a few minutes, but we've pretty well finished the budget for the year. And that will be coming up for a vote in the weeks following, um, in the month of August,
perhaps it might even be September. So those are the formal things that are coming up and we just wanted to ask if you can, uh, on the 26th, stay a few minutes so we can bring you up to date on those items. Um, now, Mara's going to lead us in some, a time of prayer, so. Oh, Mara's coming? Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted me to applaud her. Yeah, you can just bring her up. You can, you can call her okay, up. Okay, well, thank you, folks. Good morning. And when I was greeting out there, and when I look from here, it's really just precious to see your faces. All your faces are just precious to be. And I think, man... You're precious to God, precious in His sight. So um, we have access to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, and that is so amazing. And so I just would ask you to join me right now as we come to Him in prayer. Our Father, you alone are God, and there is no other. There is none like you, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient time to things yet to come. You are holy and sovereign and good, a good, good Father. We join together to declare our praise for you and our trust in you. As we were reminded this morning in song, we have fallen from your holiness and there is nothing we can do on our own to earn your acceptance. Christ paid the debt he did not owe. He exchanged our sin for his righteousness. So we praise you that despite our many sins, your mercy is more. You are all-knowing, all-powerful, and have forgiven our sins through the blood of your Son on the cross. We thank you for your patience and tenderness and for transforming us from being spiritually dead to being alive in Christ. Lord, help us to see the sin that entangles us. Help us to confess and turn from those sins so that we can reflect your image more clearly. We pray this morning that you will be our vision and that your presence will be our light in leading us through these confusing and challenging days. Help us to trust you as you use your ways to accomplish your purposes. We ask for your wisdom and for your indwelling spirit to guide us. We ask you to protect and equip us in the cultural challenges and spiritual warfare that we all face. Father, please provide for those among us who are struggling with various health issues and other issues, families who are struggling with health issues and other issues. Hold them fast. May we at Grace, as well as other churches in the surrounding area, be your ambassadors by humbly bringing your message of peace and redemption to our families, our neighbors, and even our enemies. Father, we pray for our country and our government leaders that they will have wisdom from above in responding to the current pandemic and racial issues that are spreading in our country. We pray for the global church that is facing similar and even much greater challenges, suffering from illness, and homelessness, grief, hatred, and persecution, severe persecution. May your grace, mercy, favor, and wisdom be poured out in what seems to be impossible situations. May our worship today be pleasing to you. Fill Pastor Austin with your spirit, as he shares from your word, and may our eyes, ears, and hearts be open to receive the message you have for us individually and corporately. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. I'll take that for you. Well, friends, we are in a series in 1 Corinthians, a series titled A Gospel Lens for Life. Much like a camera brings into focus what is central in all aspects of a picture, the gospel brings into focus what is central in all aspects of life. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, 23. That's chapter 9, verse 1 through 23. In chapter 8, 
Paul was challenging a certain group of Corinthians who were using their knowledge of Scripture to justify their rights to eat food offered to idols, even if it would harm their other brothers and sisters in Christ. At first glance, it would appear in chapter 9 that Paul is changing the subject, but he's actually continuing an argument that he wants to make. And it's leading us up to chapter 11, verse 1, where Paul is going to say this, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. See, in today's text, Paul is going to show us what it means to imitate him as he imitates Christ. It's for the Corinthians, but it's also for us. So as we read this text together, consider how the themes of chapter 9 overlap with the themes of chapter 8 and how it's a call to imitation, an imitation of Paul who imitates Christ. So let's read God's Word, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 23. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. This is God speaking to us this morning. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas, that is Peter? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends to a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for the ox that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we, who have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such position, for I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will... I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant or a slave to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Let's pray. Father, show us what Paul is trying to, to say to the Corinthians and what you are trying to say to us this morning. 
We want our hearts to be open, to be molded by you so that we can be like you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our youngest son, uh, he was asking us for a snack, which seems to happen almost every five minutes in my house. Uh, and so he had eaten enough, but, but we oblige, and, and we start to list off all of the healthy options that we'd be willing uh, to, to have to give to him. And eventually, after saying no to all of them, he looks up, he points his finger, and he says, I want what I want. Now, kids, they're just so unfiltered about their demandingness, aren't they? But what I've kind of thought about these last couple of days is, is that as we get older, I'm not really sure that we get less demanding. Uh, you might say that we get more mature. I think we actually just become more filtered. And the way that we make demands on the things that we believe are rightfully ours to have and rightfully ours to do. Uh, G.K. Chesterton uh, said this about rights. He said this, To have a right to do a thing is not at all the same as to be right in doing it. See, Paul is going to show us a radical way of life. It's a way of life in which our rights become extremely secondary to the purposes of the gospel. It's a lifestyle where your rights, your freedom, is filtered through the lens of the gospel. All right, so what does that mean? Well, we're going to break up this passage into three parts. Uh, Paul's rights, verses 1 through 12a. Paul's relinquishment, verses 12b through 18. And then Paul's reward, verses 19 through 23. And since this is a call to imitation, you can think of it as this way. Your rights, your relinquishment your rewards. All right, so let's jump in and, and start with this idea of Paul's rights. I, like, what is going on with these first 12 verses? Uh, Paul is like hammering out these rhetorical questions, and they seem to be building off of one another. What exactly is Paul doing? Well, what he's doing is he's, he's taking the reader or the listener, and he's transporting them into a courtroom. A courtroom where Paul uses rhetorical questions to establish the undeniable evidence that he has every right to receive accommodations from the Corinthians. Now, in light of that, we do have to keep in mind what happened in our previous section of Scripture last week. Uh, remember, it was the strong, the knower Corinthians that were making a case for their rights to eat food offered to idols, even if it was harmful to their weaker brothers and sisters. All right, so keeping that in mind, let's go into the courtroom with Paul, and let's work through these questions that he is asking. Uh, the first rhetorical question in verse 1 is this, am I not free? And, and here, what Paul is referring to is his freedom in Christ, a freedom that all of those who trust in Christ have. We share in a relationship with Christ. We share in the fellowship of the church. So at the bare minimum, Paul is a fellow believer and can share in the blessings of Christian community. But he doesn't stop there, and we'll come back to this question a little bit later because there's some interesting things about it. But he doesn't stop there. After he, he asks that question, he asks two more questions. Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Uh, here, he's not making a defense for his apostleship, but he is reminding the Corinthians that while he is a fellow brother in Christ, there is something unique about him. He was commissioned commissioned as an apostle, commissioned by Christ, face to face on the road to Damascus. And not only does he have this unique calling, but it's specifically to the Corinthians. Uh, he says after asking that question, he says, are you, are you not my workmanship in the Lord? See, Paul isn't just an apostle to anyone. He's an apostle to the Corinthians. 
Uh, there were people within the church, like we all know Paul, like it's a household name now. But back then, there would have been people who had not met Paul. They were part of the church. Uh, there would have been those who had heard of him, but didn't know him personally. This wasn't the case for the Corinthians. They knew him intimately. You know, Paul refers to himself in 1 Corinthians 4.15 as their spiritual father. And not only that, they were the seal of his apostleship, authenticating this calling that he had in Christ, as he says in, in verse 3. What does that mean to be a seal? Well, in that time, uh, a, a leader or a ruler would take his ring, his signet ring, and press it onto the wax of an envelope, authenticating the authority of that letter. Oh, this is from Caesar. This is authoritative. Well, the Corinthians were Paul's intimate impression authenticating his apostleship. All right, so what is Paul doing in this first section? He's showing the Corinthians that he has this unique apostolic relationship with them. And because of that, even just that alone, he has every right to receive accommodations from them, food, shelter, clothing. But he doesn't stop there. Uh, that's not the only reason. He also goes on to show the Corinthians that this was actually the normal relationship between the apostles and the churches. And he unpacks that in verses 4 through 6. If you go to verse 4, he says this. He says, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Okay, what is he saying there? Well, he's pointing out to the Corinthians the normal relationship that went between the churches and the apostles. The apostles would minister to the churches, and the churches would provide the basic things for sustenance that the apostles would need. And, and then he goes on, and he says in verse 5, uh, that the, it, what he says in verse 5, uh, it assumes that the apostles were also allowed to bring along with them their wives, if they had one, as companions. And the assumption there is that the churches would also provide for their spouses. And then in verse 6, Paul highlights that the normal thing is that an apostle could set aside vocational work to focus on the ministry work. And, and it's almost as if the only person he can think of that does what he does is Barnabas who works for a living and does full-time ministry. All right, so first, in this, this case that Paul is building, this courtroom with the Corinthians is, he has a unique relationship with the Corinthians. So he has every right to receive accommodations from them. Second, this was the normal relationship between the apostles and the churches. And then he goes on to say, this is just the normal way of life. And in verses 7 through 12, he points to everyday occurrences that the Corinthians would have been familiar with that furthers his case that he has a right to these accommodations. Does a soldier serve expecting nothing in return? What about someone who's hired to plant, hired to tend to flocks? Aren't their basic needs met as they live out their responsibilities? Of course. It might not be luxurious, but their basic needs would be provided for. And then after building up this strong case and all this evidence that he had every right to be receiving accommodations from the church, he points to God's word as the final authority. And he does that by quoting from Deuteronomy 25, 4, where he says this, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. I, like, what is Paul doing here? Simply put, what Paul is doing is he's arguing from the lesser to the greater. See, if God would establish a law that gave the ox a right to eat in the midst of labor, wouldn't that principle apply to the apostles? Of course it would. And then he goes on in verses 10 through 12 and states that, that those who plant seeds, they expect to receive some of the food from that harvest, don't they? And then in kind of a reversal order, uh, he goes from the greater to the lesser and, and states that, that the apostles who plant spiritual seeds that have eternal lasting value, should they not share in the temporal seeds of fruit? that is here today and, and gone tomorrow? Of 
course. And then in verse 12, after all of this, Paul says, nevertheless, we have made no use of this right. And in verse 15, he states that he's determined to not make use of it. What you should be thinking right now is, what is going on here? Like, Paul, wh like, why would you use up so much energy to, to prove from every possible angle that you deserve this right? Why would you use up so much parchment? Why would you use up so much ink to do this and then all of a sudden just say, but my whole plan is really to relinquish it anyways? What kind of courtroom is this? Making an argument for innocence and then saying, but by the way, I'm guilty. What is Paul doing? He wants the Corinthians to imitate him. You remember the stronger Noah Corinthians? They were convinced. Convinced what? Convinced that they had every right to eat what they wanted to eat. And they had the Bible to back them up. They had the chapter and the verse to prove their argument. Just because you have the right to do something doesn't always mean that it's right to do it. Paul is going to teach us a radical way, an upside-down way of living out our personal rights and our, and our freedom. Uh, it is those rights, even the ones that we can justify, it's those rights being filtered through the lens of the gospel. Like, as I've been working through this passage, it has struck me. Honestly, it's, it's really deconstructed me as I've meditated on it, contemplated on it, as I've breathed it in and tried to breathe it out as I've been going about my day. And one thing that I've discovered is this. I'm pretty good at Paul's first step. I'm a natural at, at building up a solid case for my rights and for defending what I deserve. It's the second step that I find a little bit more challenging. It's relinquishing those rights, even the legitimate ones, for the sake of others. You guys remember the first question that Paul asked at the beginning of this section. I said we're gonna come back to it. He says, am I not free? Now, this rhetorical question is incredibly ironic, especially uh, in light of what it follows. Uh, you guys remember back in chapter 8, verses 13, uh, how did Paul close up that section when he said this, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never, I will eternally never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Am I not free? You hear the irony in that? I'd imagine some of the Corinthians were wondering, what do you mean by free? You know, what kind of freedom is that? It sounds more like you're constrained by the weakness of others. You know what kind of freedom it is? It's a radical freedom. It's a freedom through the lens of of the gospel. See, anyone who is in Christ has been liberated by Christ. You are set free. But why? You are not set free to do whatever you want. You are set free so that you can be able to do what you ought. We are to live out our rights by willingly setting them aside, even those which we can justify for the benefit of others, for the sake of Christ. I, I should make a distinction here. This is not some, some sort of argument for state control. We, we don't lay down our rights compelled by the state or, or by intimidation or by some sort of cancel culture. There is a lot of interesting things going on right now, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a willingness to set aside our rights because we are compelled by Christ who set aside his rights for us. Compelled by the gospel, willing to do this, 
not needing to be compelled by something outside of us, outdoing others in it because of Christ who did it for us. All right, let's continue this this discussion over Paul's willingness to relinquish these rights, which he can make a great case for that he deserves. We know from Acts 18 uh, that Paul, when he was in Corinth for those three-ish years, planting this church, tending this church, nurturing this church, that he worked as a tent maker, which was the trade that he grew up doing. Uh, And I should point out, and I think I've already mentioned it, but point it out again, Paul's method of ministry in Corinth and also his method of ministry in Thessaloniki, uh, those were unusual. It wasn't the norm to do it the way that Paul was doing it. And because of that, we shouldn't consider this to be prescriptive for for ministry. Uh, It can be an effective way of doing ministry, and there are missions that actually focus on this idea of planting a person in a, a work environment overseas so as to be a platform for gospel ministry, but this wasn't the norm. And Paul's point is not that ministers and missionaries should have two jobs, one for earning wages and another uh, for doing full-time ministry. That's not his point. His point is made very clear in verse 12 and the second part of that. His point is this, that he will not be an obstacle to the gospel. In fact, he says this, I would endure all things. I would endure anything so as to remove even just the slightest hindrance, even just a little bit of an obstacle from the gospel being furthered in the life of another person. It's a radical, radical way of life. Uh, we are called to relinquish our rights, but, but that's not the reason we relinquish our rights. We relinquish our rights with a strategy to further the gospel. That's the point. That's the reason. It has purpose in it. Now, if that's Paul's point, he relinquishes them because he doesn't want to have any obstacles for the gospel. Really what that should do is surface like another question for us. Why exactly would receiving accommodations from the Corinthian church be a hindrance to the gospel amongst the Corinthians there? And really there's like two reasons that are, that are connected to one another. And, and one of those is the many divisions within the Corinthian church. And we've already talked about those divisions, and there's a lot of them, and we're going to continue with some of the dysfunction that's within this Corinthian church. And, and while the divisions are, are a variety of sorts, there seems to be this common like line of division, and it flows along the socioeconomic lines between the wealthy and the poor, within the church. This is going to be very evident when we get to chapter 11 and talk about the factions and the division when the church comes together for communion. But many biblical scholars, uh, they suggest that this division over eating food offered to idols also divided along socioeconomic lines between the wealthy and the poor. Why? Well, it was the wealthy that gained more of an advantage to eat whatever they wanted, to eat food offered uh, to idols. Why is that the case? Well, because this would open doors for them to mingle amongst the affluent within Corinthian society. You think about it like this, celebrations, feasts, uh, big home gatherings, and even just eating meat in general. That was something that was more common amongst the wealthy. The wealthy had more to lose by abstaining from it. And they didn't want the weaker Corinthians to get in the way of the thing that they thought was their right. So it's the first thing, and it's really connected to the second thing. Um, this is common in first century culture within Rome. Uh, and and it's, this is, it's this, a wealthy person or a group of wealthy people would oftentimes commission a local leader or an artist or a philosopher uh, by paying them their living expenses to be a community teacher such as Paul or an apostle would be. Uh, That's a really foreign concept for us, but maybe if you think about the Italian Renaissance, that was what was going on where these wealthy, powerful families would be the patron of an artist. 
Um, and you'll notice that a lot of times those patrons end up in the paintings, don't they, of those artists as well. You see, oftentimes in the patronage system, there was an expectation that was attached to the accommodation. It was assumed that the person employed would act in the best interest of the patron, of the employer. And, and for Paul, according to Paul's opinion, this would have been very problematic within the Corinthian church that was so divided, especially since it was divided along these uh, socioeconomic lines, and especially since the wealthy were so dismissive of the poor and seeing the poor as obstacles to what they wanted to do. And what Paul wants to do is completely free himself free himself of any expectation that might be attached to an accommodation and hinder his freedom, his freedom to share the gospel without filters in a way that might offend those who would have been his patron. Uh, probably should mention this as a side note. Setting aside your rights, it, it doesn't necessarily mean people-pleasing. Sometimes as we set aside our rights for the sake of the gospel, it means that we confront and challenge people from time to time, and we're willing to suffer in doing that. Paul's willing to do that as well. And in verses 13 through 14, what Paul does here is he reminds the Corinthians who he is ultimately responsible to. He only has one patron, and it's God. And what he does is he refers uh, to those who had served in the temple, you know, those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple. And those who serve the, at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. What he's saying here is basically, yeah, those who serve in the temple, they share in the sacrifices, but they don't owe anything to the Israelites who brought the sacrifices. No, they're, they're not employed by those who brought the sacrifices. They're employed by God. And so is Paul. It was the Lord who commissioned him. And even if he is to earn from the gospel, his allegiance is to one patron, to God. It's the same for us. Our allegiance is to God, who has commissioned us to be messengers of the gospel as well. So the issue here, the problem is not about receiving accommodations in general, but it's more about the specific situation. You know, Paul is using wisdom and discernment. And, and he sees that receiving accommodations in this situation could have created an obstacle for the gospel. And obstacles for the gospel is unacceptable for Paul. You know, Paul is so willing to go to such great lengths to remove any barrier for the gospel. I mean, that's his boast in life. When we look at verse 15, he goes on to explain this just radical way of gospel living. Uh, he says this. He says, I would rather die. I would rather die than receive from you what I need to survive. Why is that? Because it would remove from him the opportunity to give the gospel freely, unfiltered, and sacrificially. And then in verse 16, Paul goes on uh, to say this. He says, For if I preach the gospel, it gives me no ground for boasting. Um, for necessity is laid upon me. Uh, in some of your translations, you might see the word compelled. See, Paul boasts in the fact that he preaches the gospel under compulsion, not for compensation. And then he refers to what the prophets of old often said, I have to preach this gospel. Woe to me if I do not preach this gospel. In other words, utter calamity awaits me if I do not do what I've been commissioned to do, what God has compelled me to do. The NLT does a great job paraphrasing verse 17, so I'll just read from the NLT here. The NLT translation says this, if I were doing this, preaching the gospel, on my own initiative, voluntarily, sure, I would deserve payment, but I have no choice. For God has given me the sacred trust. This is my stewardship. 
You know, as I was thinking about that, I was, I was wondering, is that how I feel about the gospel? Is that how you feel? I have to preach it. I have to live it out. I'm not concerned about the return. I've been compelled. Woe to me if I do not preach this, if I do not live this out with the people who cross my path. You know, again, Paul's ultimate goal is that the Corinthians would imitate him as he imitates Christ. God's ultimate goal is that we would also imitate Paul. But what does that mean? How are we to imitate Paul's gospel life mentality where his rights are filtered through the gospel lens? Well, let's take a moment and just consider, you know, Paul's gospel approach as an apostle, which we are not authoritative like an apostle, but we still have the same call to be a messenger of the gospel. Every single one of us is called to live and speak the good news of Jesus with those who cross our path. So what does it look like to do that in a way that would imitate Paul? Well, in your reflection and discussion questions in that that contemplation section, uh, I'm going to leave you with some, some things to consider, to think about. Three ways of thinking that are based off of these passages. A mentality for you to put in your pocket, put in the pocket of your heart and consider as you go about this week. First, it's this. I would rather die than demand that my rights be met. I would rather die than miss the opportunity to give of myself freely and sacrificially to the people that cross my path. That's probably going to start with your family. Why do this? So that the gospel might shine brightly through my life of sacrifice. All right, that's mentality one. Mentality two, God compels me to do this. God compels me by his love and his grace to live this way. I don't need compensation for it. I'm not just willing to relinquish monetary compensation. I will relinquish emotional, relational, physical, and any kind of return or compensation for the sake of the gospel being given sacrificially and freely to those who cross my path. Third mentality. I do this because my Father in heaven has entrusted me with this sacred way of life. This is my stewardship. This is why I was set free in Christ. I am to live a freedom that is utterly free, utterly free from the demands of self-interest, self-protection, and self-promotion. I am set free so that I can live selflessly and sacrificially for those who cross my path. (laughs) It's been an interesting week for me, (laughs) trying to mold over these thoughts and consider this stuff. It's just amazing how my natural way of life is build the case for my rights, protect my rights, in just the littlest of ways. But I'm excited to see how God is going to use this mentality to conform me to the image of his son and shine brighter light for the gospel. So I invite you to do this this week. You can access those three things again on the website. Take that with you. Contemplate over it. Let it just kind of mold through your mind and your heart as you're considering what's your mentality when you bump up next to somebody at home or at work, whatever. What's your first inclination? And what does God want to call you into? Okay, so Paul has established his rights. Then he says, but I relinquished them. And then in verse 18, he asks a very interesting question. Verse 18, he asks this, what then is my reward? We probably are wondering the same thing. (laughs) Like, what reward is there in a life that is lived so radically? Paul gives us two rewards that are somewhat interconnected. Uh, The first one is this. His reward is that his life would be a paradigm of the gospel. Not just what he says, but how he lives would be a reflection of the gospel. And because of that, and this is the second reward, a variety of people would be one 
to the gospel. Okay, so this first one, that his life might be a paradigm or a reflection of the gospel. Well, what exactly is the gospel? And we've described it in a number of different ways. Uh, But here's one way that I've heard the the gospel described in a short way, and it's this. God became what we are in order that we might become what he is. God became what we are in order that we might become what he is is. See, Paul's method of ministry, it's right out of the heavenly playbook. How will humanity be saved? How will humanity be one to God? By God entering into humanity through Jesus. He became like us in order that we might be one to him. And so Paul can say in in verse 19, I am a slave to no one No one has me in bondage, yet I will make myself a slave to anyone. You know, a slave is oftentimes brought from one culture and expected to accommodate to the culture of his or her master. Paul, who says, I am free from all, says, I will enslave myself to the culture of anyone in order that they might be one to God's kingdom. Setting aside some of the things that we think are most important to win someone to something that is most important. And that list goes on in verses 20 through 23 or 22. Uh, The first thing that he says is, to the Jew, I became a Jew, which is incredibly profound. Why? Because Paul is Jewish. You guys remember when we were in our Philippians series? He was the Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of the law. Uh, But that was before he was set free in Christ. But even though he has been set free from the obligations of Jewish ritual law, he says, I will willingly place myself under that law for the right reasons. Not as a religious obligation, not in order to gain favor from God, but to gain an audience for the presentation of the gospel. Just like Jesus incarnated himself into our world, Paul is willing to incarnate himself into the Jewish world to build relations, to connect in love, to win an audience for the sake of the gospel. And then he says to those outside of the law, that being Gentiles, he is willing to become as one outside of the law. Now notice, that doesn't mean that he's willing to become lawless. He will live under the law of Christ. What does that mean? Um, He doesn't give up his moral convictions, but he sets aside the ethnic division things, like the foods and the clean and the unclean kind of things. He puts those aside, even though he grew up with them. He sets them aside for the sake of the gospel being shined in the light of others. Uh, You've probably heard this said, Jesus ate with sinners. Sure, Jesus ate with sinners, but he didn't sin with sinners. Jesus was loved by sinners, not because they associated with his sinfulness. We are called to be in the world, but not of the world. We are called to incarnate ourselves into the lives of people who are different than us, who think differently and do things differently. Not so they say, hey, you're a lot like me. No, but so that they can see that, hey, you're a lot like somebody I've heard of. I think his name is Jesus. That's what we're called to do and radically do it. And then there's this clinching moment in this whole courtroom experience that Paul has built up. And in verse 22, he says this, to the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. Remember, those stronger knower Corinthians, they were more concerned about winning the argument than winning the weak. They were more concerned about protecting their rights than protecting the wounded. At the end of verses 22 and and into 23, Paul says, I am willing to become all things to all people, just that some might be saved. And this is connected to verse 12, where he says, I would endure all things, so just to remove even the smallest obstacle 
I would become all things, even if that means just some might be saved. It's a radical way of life. Giving up everything for just even the smallest results. Why is Paul so willing to live this life in which he consistently sets aside his rights for the sake of the gospel? Because his greatest goal is the greatest reward. His greatest goal is the greatest reward. And and what is that? Well, he tells us in verse 23, he tells us that he does it so that he might share with them in the gospel's blessing. In other words, that he might be a participant, that he might be a partaker in the salvation of another person. Now, here's the thing. You might not be the one who seals the deal with someone and has that moment of praying the sinner's prayer, but don't underestimate the power of setting aside your rights so that the gospel might shine through you into the life of somebody else. Put aside the argument and the differences so the gospel might shine. Don't underestimate the power of that. Isn't it what Jesus did for you, for me, for us? Consider the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that Jesus was portrayed, right before Jesus was crucified on the cross. He didn't look up at his father, point his finger and say, I want what I want. No, he didn't say that. He said, whatever you, whatever is your will, I will do. What was the will of the father? That Jesus would drink the cup. What cup? The cup of suffering on the cross, the cup of God's wrath being poured out on Jesus so that Jesus at the cross would become what we are, would get what we deserve so that we might become what he is and get what is rightfully his. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it very well. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God, setting aside his rights so that we might become righteous. That's what Jesus did. So that's what Paul does. And that's what we are called to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this world is a mess. There's so much fighting over rights and so much platforming over what we deserve. And we might not be able to change everything that's going on, but but we can reflect on what your word is saying to us in our heart. And we can tend to our garden. Teach us. What does it mean to start with the people that we interact with on a day-to-day basis? What does it look like to set aside our our rights for our spouses, for our friends, uh, for our children, for our co-workers, for our brothers and sisters? In Christ, help us to start there. Help us to be compelled, not by fear or shame, but grace and love. This is what you have done for us. Make us capable to do it for your sake and for the sake of the gospel. We want to live for that gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? I'm going to sing the doxology. In a moment, the ushers, they will not dismiss you. They will send you to lay down your rights so as to live for the sake of the gospel. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Friends, you're sent. Imitate Paul as he imitates Christ. Amen.